everyone. We're about to start the next session. So we have here Kemal Okoyum. Um, he's going to be speaking about profiling Python with EBF. Um, profiling is certainly one of the most challenging parts I had with Python in the last 20 years when I've been coaching with the programming language. Uh, so I really can't wait to hear what you have to share with us. Thank you very much and welcome. Hello, everyone. Uh, so let's start with some questions. Uh, who does anyone here like knows anything about eBPF? Okay, quite a lot of people. Have you ever used profiling? <laughs> wow, nice. Do you know anything about Python? <laughs> Great, everyone, that's nice. Okay, first, who I am? I'm not Prometheus, but I'm a Prometheus uh, maintainer. Do you know or use Prometheus? Okay, that's also great. So uh, I'm a maintainer of Prometheus. I'm also a maintainer of Thanos. And recently, I'm a maintainer of a Parkout project. These are all open source projects, and they are all focused on observability. And I think I know something about observability. So today, I will tell you about that. Uh, so, let's start always with why. Like, why do we need profiling? It's either for some performance optimization. This graph can be anything generic. This could be CPU, this could be memory, and you see some spikes, and you would try to understand what's going on actually on those spikes. Or this could be something about an incident. This is graph is specifically for a unkill that your process and you don't know what that happened at that certain point and you would like to know about like who what function or which component of your process actually allocates the memory in that particular moment so you, some of you already know that there are, there exists some profiling solution in python these this is not an exhaustive list but most of the libraries or projects that you see in here, you actually need to instrument your code. So either you need to import a library or you need to specifically write some code and then start profiling your application, Python application. But this is not always the ideal case uh, because you would like, sometimes you don't have access to code itself and sometimes you would like to do this from outside. So how do you do that? This is where eBPF actually comes into place and helps, helps us. So eBPF is a, it's originally for networking applications. Uh, it's called Berkeley Package Filtering, but now eBPF totally something else. Uh, it's basically an event-based system where you can hook into some events that uh, Linux kernel issues, and then you can just run code uh, as a reaction to those events. There is a, a runtime, there's a virtual machine inside, and there's a verifier before you load your program, that verifier needs to check your program that it doesn't do anything harmful, like infinite loops, whatnot, in the kernel space. Then uh, compiler kicks in and compile your uh, provided code and you actually run those code against any events that you issue. That's the one fancy part of the solution. So then it comes uh, another subsystem of Linux, which is super cool, is the perf event. You can have the perf subsystem. And from the perf subsystem, you can, have, uh, you can hook into various parts of your stack, and you can run code against these events. And in this particular talk, we are going to talk about the CPU events, but you don't need to use only the CPU events necessarily. You can do this for the I.O. events, you can do this for the memory allocations, uh, practically anything that you see in here, you can run a hook into that event and run a code piece to that. So what makes perf events special? It's actually performance monitoring units. These are very efficiently implemented units in the Linux kernel so that they keep track of the uh, cycles and then uh, like uh, you can actually they take measurements and you can react to those measurements. So that's why eBPF plus perf events is actually its 
faster than the other solutions uh, that we have uh, in the basically ecosystem. Because you, with the Linux, you can already have some syscalls. You can just like uh, hook into that intraps and do the, all these things that I'm going to tell you in a minute uh, in the user space. But the most of the things we do is using the PMUs. And again, uh, because of PMUs are efficient and eBPF codes also efficient and runs in the kernel space. This gives us a bit of a headroom for the performance. So we are not the only ones that actually implemented that. This is uh, quite a journey. Uh, I don't remember the first, when is the first time that it's actually introduced the PyPerf uh, code inside the Linux kernel. You can check out. These are actual links, and I'm, go I'm going to share the slides. And you can see, uh, basically, the uh, Git comments against that. There's also. Uh, we ha a, there's a set of uh, tools called BCC tools in the eBPF space, and there's also another implementation of uh, PyPerf in there. Like, but what is the downside of all these tooling? These are first, they are dated. They don't cover all the recent changes in the Python runtime itself, and they are just one of tools. So uh, I'm going to uh, show you some cool things that you can actually do profiling in the production uh, run itself in a continuous manner, which we call continuous profiling. We, we, we're going to come to that in a minute. So for, to, to make these tools work, you need to just like wrap your Python interpreter around uh, with these tools and then uh, collect your profiles. So that gets us to the Parka project. It's an open source project. It's a continuous profiling project. Using eBPF and perf events, we can run your uh, profiling uh, workloads directly in production, and there is no runtime, nearly none, none, none of the runtime uh, overhead in this approach. There is a tiny bit, but it's really negligible. So, how does the Parka eBPF agent actually work? Similar things that I uh, mentioned previously: the hook into perf events. We have some uh, unwinder programs that actually unwinds the stack, which, we, uh, which I will tell you about. And uh, we then keep a track of like, what happens in the CPU for that stack. And then we aggregate those information and uh, put in an EBF, eBPF map, which are the special data structures that you talk uh, between kernel and the user space. And then we read that uh, data, we convert that to some open profiling formats and push that in a server site where we can just aggregate and uh, let the u and visualize that and let the users are actually make sense of their programs. So this is the how that whole thing actually works. In the there are a lot of details, but this talk is like not actually about the internals of Parka, but we, ha we are doing like a lot of cool stuff uh, to make the stack collection and symbolization very efficient. Uh, and then the end result is a UI like this. In a continuous timeline, you can see that like what's going on on, on your CPU for each process. And we collect a lot of metadata and enrich uh, those information for you and that, so that you can query, compare, and see how you can improve your program. And the agent is kind of super cool because you can just install any host machine and any process that you have on that machine, we can just collect data and send to the server and you can see that in the UI. Uh, this doesn't necessarily, like it's not scoped to the Python itself, but like it does a lot of cool stuff with the Python as well. So. There's, this is not a Python stack, but we will see some examples. But this is some, uh, I think this is a Go, Go one, but like you can see that the stacks are easily can get really deep. So what is the stack unwinding? This is the next critical thing that we need to talk about because like the whole, like the, what makes profiling challenging, especially from the Python side, is the actually to be able to unwind the stack. So when a program gets executed, probably you all heard this in your like uh, start of your education. Uh, there are uh, 
specific structures uh, when the process actually allocating the memory, which is uh, one is stack and uh, one is heap, and the stack is actually tracks the execution of the program. And whenever you call a function, you open a frame and uh, you push uh, change the states of your registers, and then you keep adding everything to the stack. And when one of the uh, functions that returns from the leaf, you just like go back and return the data to your user. So I might be oversimplified that, uh, but it's a uh, diagram to just to show you uh, how it looked like. But the end result, when you unwind the stack and aggregate all these fun function addresses, you get something like that. It's just the machine addresses, and now you need to find a way to translate those machine addresses to the human readable format. So all these parts for the native code, so anything that actually runs on your CPU. So that brings us actually the next step. So this is a state where we didn't implement the uh, Python unwinder for Parka. And uh, you can actually, this is an interactive one. So you can see the anything that gets from like your kernel, there's a start thread, this is coming from G, uh, libc. And all these green things that you see, these are coming from the Python interpreter itself because Python interpreter is written in C and it's compiled and then directly gets executed to the C on the CPU, but probably this is not useful for you, right? You are Python developers. You actually want to see the, what's happening in the Python process itself, not the underlying infrastructure. That being said, we also know that like most of the Python applications also rely on the C bits and the native code bits, and like it could calling it could be calling some C function here and there. Then when that happens, these are actually gets like super important, right? For example, PyTorch. It's very popular nowadays in the machine learning workload, but it's actually funneling everything into a native code. And when it's like when you want to see what's going on the native code. Parka actually can do that as well. And we do that in a very, very efficient way. Like you don't need to have, there's a whole concept of frame pointers and that actually helps us to unwind the stack. We just gave another talk uh, in the observability room like why frame pointers are cool. But you don't have to have, you need to have the frame pointers itself because there's also another facility with the dwarf debug information you can unwind the stack. So Parka it actually utilizes that. This is important because most of the packages that you can find on the, any of the Linux distribution, you wouldn't find uh, frame pointers. Uh, but with the Dwarf information, you can actually unwind the stack and you can see all these calls. So, but we want more, right? We want to see the Python code. So how we do actually do that? So this is where it comes to uh, where we unwind the stack virtually, with, with virtual stack, with, we mean that anything that gets executed in the Python interpreter, uh, we need to find those stacks and put those things in our flame graphs so we, we can see that like where is the problematic areas in our Python code itself. So everything starts with opening the Python runtime and reading the code. This is the huge structure, like if you know the Python inter in internals, like it's, it's long. Like there are a lot of comments, uh, but it's, it's not the easiest code to read and it, it's not the easiest code to uh, reason about. But let's focus on like what is the important bits, right? We care about the interpreter state and from those in, that bit we want to capture the, what's going on on each thread, right? It comes from the interpreter state, and then we uh, try to find the pi, uh, pi state itself. The pi thread structure, it's like a linked list, so that whenever you have multiple threads running in an interpreter, uh, you can just like, you need to traverse the whole, uh, this linked list, and for each thread, you actually need to do that. But also you need to find out a, which uh, thread actually captures the GIL and global interpreter lock so that that's the one actually executing the code. So from finding all those in, uh, information from uh, thread state, you check the thread state. Oh, yeah, 
It's another like pages long uh, C code that we need to reason about. It's not the easiest thing, but this is how reverse engineering kind of works. And again, I uh, extracted the important bits. So from that thread state, we need to find the, what is the current frame is actually executing so that we can unwind from there, right? That's actually the same thing that we are doing with the native stack, but rather than uh, checking some registries and reading raw memory addresses, we are actually checking the Python in internals itself. So from, from the interpreter frame, it's actually, it's easy. Like whatever we need, it's here. Uh, so all the information we need is here. We have the pointers to the previous stack and we can actually do the same thing. So I'm gonna speed things up. Yeah, we have the map, we know the source code, but where do we actually start? Uh, when we have an object file from the Python interpreter, we first need to find the where does like all these structs are actually live. So we check the entry point of a Python interpreter. We see that it's linked against a libpython. And we go and check the names for the, uh, one of these structs, symbols, and we actually see that there are some offsets that allocated that. But these are, this is just from the binary. We don't know what these addresses mean when a pro process started. So this happens because this is just one of the reasons, but when you get just in, uh, get a binary and uh, run, uh, run the process out of that binary, uh, there's some address randomization and all those addresses needs to be translate, translated to that. So how do we do that? We just like run a Python interpreter and check uh, what's going on in the process. Uh, we, th th this is basically memory mappings and it shows you where actually Linux maps the certain objects and we check out the lib Python, uh, grab the base address, and from the addresses that we find from the symbol or draft dwarf information, we actually find where, this, uh, where the structs are actually allocated in the memory. We are looking for those. And from that, now we need to read that data, right? So here comes the GDB. GDB is like an amazing debugging tool. And we jump into the process and started to poke around. We define a macro and to calculate the offsets of a struct, which reads from the dwarf information. Uh, you say that, okay, give me this struct and this field, and it gives you the offset of that. Since we already have the start address of the memory, we just calculate the next address and read the data from that. But as you can see, this is very manual labor. We cannot do this for the each and every Python version or implementation out there. So we uh, do this in a, in, with another project ahead of time. We use Rust PyGen for that, which was super convenient because PySpy was using that. We just like grabbed some offsets and generated all these things for a couple of versions. But we are also working on a dwarf-based reader, which is like more scalable. You just like grab the, any binaries, read the debug information and calculate all the offsets. From those offsets, we generate this struct, which we synced over the kernel space. It's like a map where to find the fields and everything. And the nice part that the whole things that we are working on, it's going to be deprecated soon because Python, <laughs> <laughs> this is life of a software engineer when you do reverse engineering. So that, that something super cool happened with the, uh, in the Python main branch. Now they, are, they have this uh, debug offset data structure where you, they generate all the offset and put that in the, just the beginning of the pi run, run time. We just can grab the address and just read the first chunk of the uh, thing. Oh, we got the offset. We don't need to do this ahead of time things right now. So it's going to be, this is already March and it's going to be released with the Python 3.13. It's also, yeah, huge. Like lots of stuff that you need to find out. Okay. Actual unwinding stack. So this, these are where the eBPFs come, comes from. Like we did all the magic, we got the offsets, we put that thing into an interpreter info structure and put that in an eBPF map so that eBPF program can read uh, in the kernel. And this C code is in the kernel itself. We check something and get the interpreter info. This is the user space code where we actually calculate all the addresses and send and put to the eBPF. Uh, map itself, and from that we also grab this offset data that we calculated. We just do check some uh, versions and find the uh, runtime version of that uh, particular Python interpreter, read the offsets, and from that offsets we calculate that. But again, like 
this, is, this will be futile. So then we read, uh, try to read the oops, read the data uh, from the thread state, uh, find those structures and read the pointers and try to find out where to go from there. Five minutes left, I need to be super quick. Okay, so uh, we, find the in, we try to find the initial pointer to, for the virtual frames. This is how we do it. And then from that, we start walking the stack. Uh, the key points uh, here is just from the previous code that you can see, we actually put uh, just line 13, put something into a state to the uh, frame pointer, and we then read that frame pointer from another eBPF program. And from that uh, uh, pointer, we basically find the offset of the frame object where the co code points to, read that row address with some uh, BP, uh, BPF helper code. And from that, we read the symbol because like the addresses that we saw that they don't mean anything to us. We are humans and we need some human readable data. And from that, to be efficient, because we keep seeing the same uh, stack traces, uh, we just like hash it and put that symbol somewhere so that if we see that, we don't need to send that same symbol to the user space because it's costly. And then we also encode the line number because yeah, symbols just represents a class, then a function, and then there's a line number in that function that is different. This API also recently stabilized in the Python, so for the old Python versions, this line number could be wrong, but the re after 3.10, it's actually it should be accurate. And then uh, uh, we encode that as well and send to the user space. This is the reading the simple parts, uh, like the code is like super complicated. I just highlighted the GDP outputs because it's like easier to read. So you read this nested structures and find the actual type name then the file name, then the name of the object code and the first line in that function and put and encode that as a uh, symbol so that it means something for the humans. And voila, now we finally have Python unwinded stack. But as you can see, there are lots of things going happening and most of the things are, are interpreters and it doesn't make any sense. But we have this cool UI, you can actually, these are like, color coded, you can, from the color code, you can actually highlight like what's going on in the inter interpreter, what happens to the libc, lib python, you can see everything, but, the, but again, we want to focus on the python bits, right? You can just filter out the python code and see that it's recursively calling and calculating some Fibonacci numbers. Apparently, yeah, it's inefficient, so you need to optimize this. You can just tell by like depthness of the stack, okay, yeah. You don't need to know the details of how to read the uh, flame graph. But good thing for you, we also have a blog post for that. Like you can check it out. So I guess we are nearly out of time. So we support a couple of interpreters like 2.7, we still support that. So if you happen to have that. Uh, we support everything until 3.11. We are working on the uh, 3.12 because 3.12 changes where uh, the, actually the thread state also stored, which is the thread local storage. We are uh, working on the facilities to read the state from the thread local storage. It shouldn't take more than a couple of weeks to be actu that support actually landed. And 3.13 will be there, so we don't need to do this again, basically, for the next version of the Python. So, Everything you can see, please try, install, and like, give us a feedback. There's this uh, QR code. It's a GitHub discussion. You can just like, engage with us and report bugs, and we can try to help you to profile and optimize your Python workloads. All the things that you see here, there's also a blog post. If you want to catch up, you can check the company's blog post. And also, we find that the war find unwinding bits like super cool because it's a niche thing that we do. And if you, especially like the, uh, if you have an application that funnels everything to the native code, this would be super useful. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Kamal. I'm afraid we're quite tight on the schedule. 
but please feel free to reach out to him with any questions. Yeah. Um, and thank you very much. Thank you.